Hello, everybody. Welcome to day 12 of Advent of Code in Kotlin. As announced yesterday, we are starting, I think, an hour later than usual. No, half an hour later than usual. Um, and that's because just prior to this, we had the Kotlin for WebAssembly live session happening here on our channel. In case you did manage to catch that, feel free to mention that in, in the chat. And otherwise, if you are here today again for this day 12 stream, make sure you say hello. Time really flies in December when we do these kind of streams. It's really this cycle of, you know, getting up at, at least for me, it's getting up at six solving the problems or attempting to solve the problems uh, and then 12 hours later we we begin the streams uh and then you know it all repeats again but as maya points out this is the final stream that we will be doing this year so thank you to everyone already who has stuck around uh for for our campaign it's so nice to see everyone again in the chat. This is delightful. Hello, everyone. Um, it's important, or I'd like I'd like to mention though that just because we are no longer doing these live streams every day, um, that doesn't mean that Advent of Code 2023 with Kotlin is over in any way, um, because by now you know. We have a whole campaign going on with leaderboards, a bunch of resources, and even with prizes. And even if, if this is the first time you're stumbling across Advent of Code in Kotlin on day 12, first of all, good on you, welcome. But also, it is still not too late to register on one of our leaderboards uh, and get the uh, opportunity to potentially win some prizes. Unfortunately, it will be the last day today where you'll see my beautiful Christmas hat and the uh, dramatic reading um, of the Advent of Code puzzles. So that you'll have to do without. But I'm sure the puzzles themselves will suffice. I'm curious. How did everyone feel about today's task? About today's challenge? Let's actually have a look here what people have have written so far. Um, have a look here. Um, we have some folks who say, today, I just ran out of time. Normally I'm using my lunch break to hack a quick and dirty solution, but after 30 minutes or so, I had to continue with my day job. You know what? I was in somewhat of a similar boat. Um, yeah, exactly. I have a super concise solution with only a few lines of code, but I lack the living years to see it finish. Um, we've also, uh, yeah, a couple of folks, actually myself included, uh, had today be the first day where the second part, uh, where they couldn't finish the second part within the time that they decided uh, they were going to spend on the problem. And that's okay, because because especially in that situation, good that you tuned in today. We'll we'll all learn something new together. Um, yeah, Mike says doesn't know didn't know how to get part one done again. Great, that just means that there's something new to learn because the challenges or or I think the skills that you learn during Advent of Code are very much transferable, at the very least, to future Advent of Code events. Um, so, that's uh, that's definitely helpful. Um, Dave says, today's solution can involve recursing, as in cursing over and over again until you figure it out. Okay. Uh, Maya has done a little bit of background work. Uh, Try to figure out how to solve it, but doesn't have any stars yet. And there's a couple of folks stuck on part two. 
Uh, Damir says, yeah, read it and immediately knew. Won't be doing it today. And maybe it's just a matter of computing power. Who knows? So, just like with all the previous days, today is no different. I'll have someone uh, on as a guest who brings their own unique perspective on Kotlin and on the problem. I've already teased a little bit that today's guest has something to do with Kotlin Notebooks. So, uh, I am very excited uh, to introduce to all of you Ilya. Hi, Ilya. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sid. And hi, everyone. How's it going? How, how, are, you, how are you enjoying Advent of Code so far? Uh, that's, like, very uh, nice and very interesting for me to solve uh, the problems. Uh, that's uh, actually what I like to do uh, in my job, solving problems. And here you have, like, some problems with uh, uh, with the limited timeline uh, to accomplish. And uh, it's very, uh, like, pleasant to uh, have such uh, problems sometimes because uh, in um, in real in real job in real work uh, it often happens that uh, you can't accomplish the task in several weeks and here you just write the code and in several hours you get or maybe minutes you get the solution. It's that's, all uh, that's cool. nice, all nice and time boxed, I guess, um, in this way. But yeah, for people uh, who maybe don't you know you, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Uh, yep, I'm working in JetBrains uh, in uh, uh, Kotlin Notebooks team. I'm actually leading this team and uh, I am uh, wrote like uh, a lot of code uh, there myself and uh, now we're like several several folks that uh, do the notebooks and solve uh, all the related technical problems so uh, i will probably showcase uh, something today uh, showing a bit different uh, sides of how you can use notebooks different from what roma showed uh, on 5th of december Okay. Well, that's a that's a pretty pretty awesome uh pretty awesome thing to uh to look forward to here, I guess. Um because I have to admit uh when so we did have we did have Roman on earlier this uh this year, I should say. That sounds like it's so far away, but earlier in this campaign, a couple of days ago. Um and I think he he showed a a, a very nice demo um of like also the visualization capabilities of notebooks uh and so on so i'm i mean if you've seen that stream or if you haven't caught up with it yet make sure you do take a take a look at the recordings um i was kind of grinning all throughout like i was i was like a, a happy happy fella because it was just a a very uh yeah it, it's a it's a very cool and very novel way of working with um uh, with kotlin code so I'm, I'm very, very delighted to have you here. So, um, with that, I think we can probably dive straight into today's problem. So, uh, you'll notice, and I did mention this before, but I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not keeping any secrets here. You'll, you'll see that for me. There is only one golden star so far on this page. So I'm hoping that throughout today's stream, I'll learn a little bit that maybe will help me get that second star. But to get to that point, we first need to learn a little bit about today's challenge. So hat goes on. We're in dramatic reading mode. We're ready for day 12 hot springs you finally reach the hot springs you can see steam rising from secluded areas attached to the primary ornate building as you turn to enter the researcher stops you wait 
I thought you were looking for the hot springs, weren't you? You indicate that this definitely looks like hot springs to you. Oh, sorry, common mistake. This is actually the onsen. The hot springs are next door. You look in the direction the researcher is pointing and suddenly notice the massive metal helixes towering overhead. This way. It only takes you a few more steps to reach the main gate of the massive fenced-off area containing the springs. You go through the gate and into a small administrative building. Hello, what brings you to the hot springs today? Sorry, they're not very hot right now. We're having a lava shortage at the moment. You ask about the missing machine parts for Desert Island. Oh, all of Gear Island is currently offline. Nothing is being manufactured at the moment, not until we get more lava to heat our forges. And our springs. Springs aren't very springy, unless they're hot. Say, could you go up and see why the lava stopped flowing? The springs are too cold for normal operation, but we should be able to find one springy enough to launch you up there. It's just one problem. Many of the springs have fallen into disrepair. So they're not actually sure which springs would even be safe to use. Worse yet, their condition records of which springs are damaged, your puzzle input, are also damaged. You need to help them repair the damaged records. In the giant field just outside, the springs are arranged into rows. For each row, the condition records show every spring and whether it is operational dot or damaged hashtag. This is the part of the condition records that is itself damaged. For some springs, it is simply unknown, question mark, whether the spring is operational or damaged. However, the engineer that produced the condition records also duplicated some of this information in a different format. After the list of springs for a given row, the size of each contiguous group of damaged springs is listed in the order those groups appear in the row. This list always accounts for every damaged spring, and each number is the entire size of its contiguous group. That is, groups are always separated by at least one operational spring. Four hashtags would always be four, never two, two. So, condition records with no unknown spring conditions might look like this. However, the condition records are partially damaged. Some of the spring's conditions are actually unknown, question mark. For example, like this one. Equipped with this information, it is your job to figure out how many different arrangements of operational and broken springs fit the given criteria in each row. In the first line, three question marks, a dot, three hashtags, and then one, one, three, there is exactly one way separate groups of one, one, and three broken springs in that order can appear in that row. The first three unknown springs must be broken, then operational, then broken. So hashtag dot hashtag, making the whole row, hashtag dot hashtag dot, and then three hashtags. The second line is more interesting. This one could be a total of four different arrangements. The last question mark must always be broken to satisfy the final contiguous group of three broken springs. And each double question mark must hide exactly one of the two broken springs. Neither double question mark could be both broken springs or they would form a single contiguous group of two. If that were true, the numbers afterward would have been two, three instead. Since each double question mark can either be hashtag dot or dot hashtag, there are four possible arrangements of springs. Because the last line is actually consistent with 10 different arrangements. Because the first number is three, the first and second question mark must both be question mark, uh, sorry, dot. If either were hashtag, the first number would have, been, would have to be four or higher. However, the remaining run of unknown spring conditions have many different ways they could hold groups of two and one broken springs. In this example, the numbers of possible arrangements for each row is, for this specific row, one arrangement, then four, one, one, four, and ten. Adding all of the possible arrangement counts together produces a total of 21 arrangements. 
for each row, count all of the different arrangements of operational and broken springs that meet the given criteria. What is the sum of those counts? All right, that was a bit of a longer one than usual again. Ilya, when you first read this this problem statement, did did a specific approach come to mind for you? Uh, actually, first thing uh, that I did after copying the uh, uh, example, uh, like my input, yeah, uh, was to check how many question marks at most we have uh, in a line. Okay. Uh, because uh, actually from this uh, uh, depends the approach. Uh, if uh, two uh, power power uh, to the um, to the number to the maximum number of question marks is not too big number. For example, uh, if there uh, like 20 uh, question marks, then there will be around million uh, variants of how uh, um, like how all the broken regions uh, are situated and you can just uh, enumerate all of them and then choose the correct one correct ones and uh, count it this way. So uh, if uh, the number of question marks is not that big, uh, you can uh, try uh, enumerating, and it will work. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're kind of on. Uh, you're very much on the same track as as me. I think you're also in the on the same track as as Herbert here, who said I just brute forced it with permutations of all components so groups and empty tiles and a regex to check the result against but there's a lot of uh, permutations to check um and i mean i i think we'll we'll see a bunch of your code in a second so i'll i'll just i'll start us off with and we can take a look at my solution um and and then from there we can we can go to yours because i i essentially had the the same the same approach specifically what 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 i noticed looking at this kind of pattern like the pattern where you have individual like components move like one over to the other it's like this kind of seems like binary numbers to me like essentially we're we're just modeling like this whole group or, or essentially all the question marks together they're just a a number some kind of number and if i binary if i represent it as binary then that is a unique state of how each question mark is either turned on or off or whether it's like broken or not broken yes. so yeah so the way that the way that i approached this in, in in my code here was um first of all the parsing logic isn't particularly interesting since our input is just well it's a, a kind of pattern string at the very beginning and then it's these uh, three and four um, so I just split those out using the regular standard library functions we've already seen a bunch of times. You'll actually see that even in my solution, <laughs> I I do the same thing as you. I, I actually check what's the maximum numbers of, of question marks in a line. Um, mm -hmm. I did that previously. I did that beforehand, but I just wanted to make sure it's, it's actually visible at the bottom. So if we do run the solution here for a second, um, we will see that the maximum is 18 in my input. So that's two to the 18 combinations that I can brute force. That's like 260,000. That's it's which, which, yeah, it doesn't seem that bad. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. So the problem statement really asks for, well, the sum of all the valid arrangements. So I created a function that just computes those valid arrangements. Um, for that, I grab myself all the indices in a in a given record, so in a given like pattern string that that looks like this. I'll, I'll figure out at what indices do I have a question mark, um, and then I'll I'll go through the all the numbers, all the binary numbers that I could represent with that many bits. Um, which is just two to the power of however many question marks I have. And then mm -hmm. with that, 
um, I'll, I'll iterate over like each binary number, which is just one way of like permutating, permuting, I don't know, um, of, of iterating over uh, each possible combination of uh, question mark of, of hashtags and dots. And I'll check whether those are valid. And validity, like this is this is the only part where there's there's a little trickiness kind of going on here. Um, so I decided that because I figured it's not going to influence my runtime complexity too much, like it's not going to make a huge difference. I'll actually work with like real strings rather than the um, rather than like a binary representation and then like shifting around. So I decided, okay, mm -hmm. I'll 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 just make sure I have a binary. My my binary number is the is is a string of ones and zeros with the same length as uh as my with the same length as the number of question marks that i have in my input string so for that i can i can just use two string with radix two so that gives me binary representation and then by using pad start i can add extra zeros until i've reached the, my desired size and then we just do a little bit of string manipulation. Um, I used a string builder here um, that I just start out with the original pattern. And then for each uh, of my question mark indices, I do this kind of mapping. So if if I have a if I have a binary number that's like zero 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 one one zero and I have this pattern down here, then I'll essentially I'll assign each um, each digit in my number to one of the question marks. And those might, of course, be like slightly shifted over to the side. So in this case, like my zero would go to the first question mark, this zero would go to the second question mark, and so on, even when there's this other like symbols in between. Once you've done that, like I essentially just replace this. Um, I just use the string builder as kind of a, a mutable string so that I can make these changes without having to reallocate a new string every single time. Once I have that, I essentially just need to figure out if my arrangement has the same groups as my uh, as like the input prescribes, and that description, can... yeah, yes, exactly. So, um, so that that I can do just with a regex. So I'll I'll take a look at my my string, and this will give me like all the contiguous groups, um, and all I need to figure out is like how long is each contiguous group. That'll give me the exact same representation as is in the input. And then I'll just check whether those match. And from there, it's just counting all of them. Um, and you're kind of done. So you can see that it takes a little while, uh, even though the input is only a thousand elements long. So it does it does take a, a little bit. But uh, but it does work and it it completes in a in a humanly awaitable time. <laughs> yep. So, any thoughts on this approach? <laughs> ah, uh, it's it was a question to me, right? Oh yeah. I mean, the chat is of course also very much invited. If you are watching, if you do have an opinion yeah. here, um, Dave does say it's almost exactly the same approach uh, that he used. <laughs> um. Yeah, it, uh, the idea, the main idea was uh, the same. Uh, I mean, uh, all enumeration and uh, just validation of the variance. But uh, I rather used uh, not string uh, operations, but uh, binary arithmetics. Uh, and maybe it made uh, the runtime complexity a bit lower uh, in my case. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure. I'll, uh, like algorithmic complexity is the same, I believe. Okay. Uh, I can sh I can show I can show you my uh, solution to it. Uh, like show some moments in it. That sounds like a great wish. idea. So we'll just switch over uh, to your screen, um, and then you can walk us through um, what you have. So we have your screen up now. Cool. Uh, so. Uh, just uh, like you, that's uh, the part that we don't need here. Uh, just like you, uh, I split it uh, like everything and uh, got 
the description. It's uh, the list of integers and uh, the string. Uh, then I just uh, count the number of question marks and uh, count how many variants we should enumerate. Uh, I uh, count uh, two power Q count, and it actually could be done with the uh, uh, beat uh, operation, uh, shift left. Uh, and after that, uh, we create a Boolean array with the same length as the string has and uh, mark all the places where we have uh, this like broken mark uh, with true and others are false. And then we just go through all the variants. Variants are just numbers. So we need to uh, uh, like take uh, from uh, each variant, we need to uh, take uh, the corresponding uh, like it's it's a mask uh, binary mask thing. Yeah. So uh, you count and between uh, between k and the, the current variant uh, and set up uh, all the question marks in correct positions. So uh, uh, in here, so here we uh, get our SA array boolean array uh, set up correctly well, uh, how our variant says us and uh, then we just uh, call describe describe uh, returns the list of integers here and uh, just compare the lists and if they are equal uh, increment result uh, describe uh, works uh, it's very ugly function but it uh, essentially builds the list uh, by the mask yep so uh, mostly it's like your solution yep yeah it's, it seems like it's a very similar approach i do have to say yep. uh, what i actually like is is the way that you do the uh the, the power of two it, just by doing a, a one and then like left shifting that is it's probably actually a little more elegant than needing to convert into doubles and then doing like pow and then converting those back to integers so this is a yeah. um yeah it's, uh... I'm also afraid afraid of uh, con conversions and oh I yeah try to avoid them. right rightfully so I think yeah <laughs> um yeah but I mean this is uh this 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 is a the, the kind of the same same approach here so um yeah. I think your your notebook story is going to begin in part two yes yes okay very good um uh, so I will um show you but before uh, before my, we do that we gotta yep. make sure that we also read the the problem statement for that uh, sure if, yeah so Sorry. let me just uh no don't worry all good so let me just switch over here again and we'll see because you know what could possibly go wrong with the approach um that we have so let's have a look and read part two Hat goes on. As you look out at the field of springs, you feel like there are way more springs than the conditional records list. When you examine the records, you discover that they were actually folded up this whole time. To unfold the records on each row, replace the list of spring conditions with five copies of itself separated by question mark and replace the list of contiguous groups of damaged springs with five copies of itself separated by comma. So this row would become the five times multiple of it. And the first line of the above example would become this much longer line. In the above examples, after unfolding, the number of possible arrangements for some rows is now much larger. One arrangement, then 16,384 arrangements, one arrangement, 16 arrangements, 2,500 arrangements, and 506,250 arrangements. After unfolding, adding all the possible arrangement counts together produces 525,152. 
unfold your condition records what is the new sum of possible arrangement counts now yeah you've solved this um so i'll be, be before before i let you tell a story that arrives at a solution here i i, I just want to briefly mention what this this whole thing looked like for me this morning because I, I did spend about three hours uh or so uh trying to come up with an interesting solution but i didn't arrive at anything that was that was computationally uh feasible because the the big problem like the the problem that that underlies all of this is that we remember uh how many how many question marks we had at maximum which was 18. Now, if we were to multiply 18 by 5, and then we also, in theory, add for each group, like between each group, another uh, another question mark. So I think that would be 94 in total. Uh, we get 2 to the 94 uh, possible, possible values that we would have to iterate. Now, this is a big number. Um, and I think uh, if we if we take a look here, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense um, what Herbert says is, I have a super concise solution with only a few lines of code. I just lack the living years to see it finish. Because, yeah, of course, adopting this solution that, that I've written here to, to take that new input or to generate that new input is a matter of, like, a, a repeat string five times and then, like, join... It together with a bunch of question marks but that's not feasible so i went down a couple of other rabbit holes i tried to see if there was some kind of combinatorical solution that you could maybe just figure out just by just based on like looking at it but i couldn't really discern a pattern here um I got a little distracted with this number as well, because uh, if we, once again, sometimes taking a look at numbers, uh, Wolf from Alpha is, is always my, my friend to see a couple of patterns. And this one happens to be a, just a, a prime factor of like a 2 to the 14th, where I'm like, okay, maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe that's just like, maybe that's because it's 1, 1, and 3? And like I wasn't sure, and because all of the other numbers, I I couldn't make heads or tails out of those. Um, it it didn't seem like any of those had like interesting primary um, prime factorizations or anything like this. I actually then called up a, a friend, and and we we tried to like work through this together. Um, and one of the things that we did end up remembering from university was this concept of sterling numbers which is like if you have uh if you have specific groups um that are let me see if where we have the a proper uh a proper definition um the sterling numbers of the second order i believe are are kind of how you can how you can distribute uh contiguous groups of elements across a number of like slots it's been about six or seven years since i've last even looked at these so needless to say this didn't go anywhere but at least squinting at it and trying to figure out if maybe it would be useful uh was of course something that that i looked at or that we looked at and then one of the other things was maybe there's something like maybe there's a there's a simple pattern in uh in this where where we can where we can just like evaluate each of the of the five multiples individually and then use some kind of multiplication at the end or again some some operation to just join everything together but the problem with this is that that would actually i think work great if only they weren't separated by question marks if they were separated by dots that would be perfectly fine but with question marks you can have contiguous groups that span over like the 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 splits kind of that you that you merge together which which really throws a, a wrench into something and then we, we spitballed a, a couple of other ideas but at that point i had spent three hours on the problem like going into one direction or no direction um and i ended up also having to do a bunch of other work <laughs> during the day um so i decided 
all right uh it's okay i know that uh, at, at this point i think Ilya, you you actually wrote me and you said well it, it took a while but i have a solution for part two so i could like breathe out a little bit because i knew that at the very least i was gonna have a chance to learn how to properly approach this one so yes uh, this was a very long winded way of just saying i tried a bunch of things and none of them worked out but it was an interesting and, and very engaging thing to uh to discuss in in and of itself when you saw this did you immediately have an approach in mind um no um like i know a couple of approaches uh, but uh, i like you i tried uh, to think of uh, something uh, else uh, something maybe simpler but uh, just going through all approaches i know i found uh, the correct one for this uh, problem uh, in the end uh, and it actually it it amazed me like how uh, how similarly we think because um, it is like all this this thing that you say about uh, combinatorics, uh, they are not uh, directly involved uh, in the solution, but uh, this uh, task is obviously combinatorical, and uh, I will show like how it is connected with other uh, objects in combinatorics uh, later today. Okay. Great. Well, um, I think just just like everyone else who maybe hasn't managed to solve this problem, or or who maybe just struggled for it for for a little too long, or is not entirely happy with their own solution, I'm very excited to learn. Uh, I'm very excited to see how you approached this this problem. So I'm going to bring your screen uh, back up on the stream. And you can walk us through how we can solve this without iterating like 150 quadrillion uh, different uh, different combinations. Yep. Uh, first of all, I uh, would say that uh, this approach uh, is better to write in uh, in general Kotlin file, and uh, we will use a notebook mostly for visualization of the code that we wrote here in. Uh, general Kotlin files, and then we will just use uh, the functions that we wrote uh, to visualize our uh, solution and to make it uh, look more interesting. So, um, what happens here? Here, we do like the same stuff, uh, but uh, do these preparations uh, that are described uh, in the task. We do repeat list. Repeat list uh, is uh, the utility function that I created. It uh, does exactly the same. The, this like repeats the list five times, uh, and also we uh, repeat our record five times, uh, split it by question marks, uh, and then we call this uh, function which uh, calculates arrangements uh, for this record and this description. Um, let's, uh, see what, what it does. Like, uh, first of all, we built a mask, uh, by the description. Uh, how does the mask look like? Uh, essentially, uh, if, uh, the description is, uh, something like, uh, one, two, three then the mask will be a boolean array uh, which uh, contains zeros uh, in the very end and in the very beginning and then they are splitted uh, sequences of uh, ones so it is one uh, zero one one zero one 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 zero like this uh, we get something like this from the description array. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, then we do some, like we store some uh, 
variables that we need we will need next and then we go to our approach like what is the approach approach is called uh, dynamic programming uh, uh what is it yeah like um uh, you think of your problem as the problem that has uh like the function essentially the function that has several arguments the number of these arguments are dimensions of your uh dynamic solution uh dynamic programming solution uh in our task uh we have uh three dim dimensions actually uh first dimension is the length of the string uh second dimension is the length of the mask and third dimension it is boolean one and it means was the previous uh character a dot or it was a broken uh symbol like uh, ds mm -hmm. um so uh and actually we create a tables uh, like matrices for uh to represent uh these states uh and we create like two matrices because uh each matrix matrix has two dimensions actually so we have two matrices and this like two matrices means that we have this third dimension third boolean dimension uh what uh does the number means number means actually the answer of the subtask uh so we like try to solve not the whole task but we try to solve some uh smaller task for a string which is not uh n characters length but some i characters length and we try to solve uh, like the prefix of the input string and we try to solve uh it for the mask which is not uh m uh uh boolean elements big but uh only we try to solve it only for some prefix of this mask and try to figure out uh how to uh knowing solutions of smaller tasks we can uh solve this task like how we can uh through knowing this solution we can uh delegate to uh smaller solutions essentially it it is like recursion but uh it's a bit more e efficient because uh we store all the um all all the values uh in uh, in the table and actually it's like recursion with memoization uh so uh yeah and in and uh, one more profits of uh, uh dynamic programming uh in favor of recursion is that it allows us to uh go uh through uh through all the calculations in in the order that we need so we manage the order uh, of how we do the calculation we can write our own loops uh, to make this calculation uh and like in recursion uh we also should have some base uh so here we have the base uh it means that for empty string uh for empty string empty mask uh but not empty mask actually it means it means empty string and it means uh a mask containing only first element uh we consider that this is the solution so uh if you have uh empty string and mask containing only a dot uh then it it is okay like uh it is appropriate solution and uh, we consider like yes this is one solution and it doesn't depend actually on uh what uh, was the previous uh 
previous character, yeah? It was uh, broke inside this uh, DS or it was points. Uh, that's why we assign both uh, to one. And uh, then we do the loop. Uh, in the loop, uh, we also have some uh, base, like now we have the base for J, which is equal to zero. And uh, what happens here? Here we uh, here we check actually the current symbol. Like yeah, if it's dot or question mark, then we delegate uh, to the previous symbol of the character uh, of the of the string. So um, it actually means that our mask. Uh, if we if we are here, it means that J is zero and uh, I is not zero. It means that our mask has only one dot now, and it means that in our string we should have all the dots or question marks. So to check it, we should uh, just drop the last character in the string and check all other uh, characters that they are correct. And to do this, we just do this, like we delegate to the previous uh, substring uh, of, of our string, to the smaller one. For example, uh, right, like, yeah, if we have uh, a substring, uh, if, if, if we have a string uh, dot dot uh, question mark dot, then here we just uh, delegate to a smaller, to, to a previous prefix, like uh, to this one. Uh, but, uh, if we have, if we have, um, dot, dot, question mark, uh, broken, then in case of, uh, um, in case of matrix, uh, in case of our, uh, mask doesn't have any, uh, broken symbols, it means that they are not compatible. And, uh, that's why this uh, condition is here, actually. Uh, so, like, it is the base, and then we go to to the like our main loop, and here the mask uh, isn't empty, and the string uh, also isn't empty, and uh, we should uh, take into account uh, like three cases. Yeah, uh, the current uh, the current uh character is a point it is uh, broken or it is a question mark and as you can see like from top level uh, perspective yeah like we say that okay in this case uh we will consider the point case in this case we will consider broken case and in this case we will consider both cases considering means uh, just adding uh some values to our uh dynamic tables yeah so uh what uh, how, how are we considering points uh we uh, look at our mask first of all uh and it's important like now we are at the point uh in the string right and uh we need that in the mask we also would be in the point. Uh, that's why uh, we just go to the previous uh, position in the string, but don't move on the mask because uh, on the mask we have only one point between uh, between the broken parts, as you remember. So we stay on this point and don't move uh, our pointer for uh, for it on the mask, but move the pointer for a string. And it's essential here that we use uh, our P DP PT. It means that the previous uh, character was the point because we're considering the point now, actually. And it, it is crucial for the second case, actually. Um, here we uh, updating both, uh, but for the second case, it's crucial what one we are updating. So uh, 
here you can see that uh, we check uh, if we are uh, on the broken on the broken uh, mark. Uh, then we adjust uh, moving uh, on the mask and moving on the, on the string uh, for both of our arrays. But uh, of course, for this like. We uh, were uh, mark we were marking that the previous state was broken one. But uh, what to do if we are on the point on the mask, but in the string we're on the broken mark? Uh, actually, what does it mean? It means that we can move uh, on the next uh, next step uh, on the broken mark. But only in case if the previous uh, previous one wasn't a point, because if the previous one uh, well, no, like if the previous one wasn't a break, uh, it wasn't a broken mark. Because if the previous one was a broken mark, it means that uh, we take uh, we um, receive uh, the continuous. Um, continuous sequence of the broken marks actually uh, and uh, it's not what we want because we need that uh, these broken sequences were limited in size we don't want them to be uh, glued together that's why uh, this uh, hack here uh, in other case uh, we would just need two dimensions not three but uh, for this thing we need third dimension actually and uh, yeah it, it kind of makes the solution a bit harder and uh, actually that's it because our solution is now in the uh, last in the uh, last row in the last column uh, of our dppt table uh, because uh, we are Considering that we like starting with with the uh, with the points, actually, and uh, we just we can just return it. So we can just do this loop uh, with these uh, strange assignments, uh, and uh, in the end we return our um, uh, number. So it, it it probably will be big enough, but it will take not too long to. To calculate it, actually, yeah, it's uh, it's something about uh, square uh, uh, square of the length of the string, I believe. Like it's not not too big because the biggest string, uh, like I believe, they are not bigger than several hundreds of symbols. So it it is it is okay. It is fine to have square uh, square of the length of the string. So. Uh, yeah, so we return it there and then just do some off and yeah, that that's that's it. Okay, uh, we have a couple of people here. <laughs> yeah, some said they uh, l looking at this, they don't feel ashamed lightning on the first star, and I think yeah, uh, uh, certainly not not uh, not something that I would come up with at at six in the morning. I'll be I'll be honest with you. Um, Jonathan does say, though, I uh, should have thought of dynamic programming, did so much uh, with that in my university times. It's a, it's a good move. I think, but in, in theory, so the the fact that you're not using recursion here is, is kind of, a, it's a further optimization, right? Like, you, you could do the same approach using recursion and then also kind of doing the dynamic programming part of probably caching some sub- uh, subsequences or the, the evaluation of those would would that be right? Um, I think uh, yes, it, it could be accomplished with the recursion, but uh, the code would be harder to write and to read uh, actually because uh, we need to do memoization and uh, stuff like this, and it will be uh, in runtime. It will be it, it will work uh, slower because uh, like just working with arrays and with loops uh, is always uh, faster than calling re recursive functions. 
that makes sense. So how how long did it take you to come up with this solution? Um, like uh, I believe like several hours. Okay. <laughs> Great. So yeah, um, that makes me feel not so you know imposter syndrome then. <laughs> <laughs> I did, uh, I did hand in the the first solution, um, and I think maybe after I handed in the first solution or, or like a couple of minutes after I went into um, into the second part, I just checked back on the leaderboard and I saw Roman Yelizarov already having two stars. Um, and I was like, oh no, either this is either Roman is being really clever here uh, or or I'm missing something like super obvious, which is which I think is actually what kind of sent me down this rabbit hole of like, maybe this is just like adding a bunch of like um combinatorics like so, some stuff like that <laughs> R roman is actually a like competitive programming guru and that's why yeah you you shouldn't be ashamed at all yeah uh, it, it does seem that the that the only times i i can i can consistently beat him is when he's at the breakfast buffet um and i get a head start <laughs> of about half an hour on a task that takes three minutes <laughs> that's that's about the the way that i can i can um secure a spot on the on the leaderboard <laughs> above him but it's not about that it's about like learning something new um i'm gonna be honest with you i think i'll i will have to ponder the solution and like look at this for an extended period of time uh, before I'll, I think I'll, I'll grasp all the, the intricacies of it. Um, but I think the, the overall approach of like divide and conquer, um, makes, makes a lot of sense for the problem. And I, I think there's a couple of other people. Um, let me just briefly see here. Um, we have someone saying brute force in part one, then switch to a smart recursive version, um, that, wasn't really going anywhere until I remember to put in some cash, which I mean, hey, that's that's dynamic programming, I suppose. Um, and then it worked in 130 milliseconds. That's a that's a good move. Um, and I think, yeah, yep. I've had a couple of other folks here as well. Um, I'm not sure, Ilya, if you if you do have one, um, but maybe if you can, and we'll happily share this afterwards, is uh, is a request for maybe some kind of article or other uh, knowledge base where you can learn more about. Dynamic programming, targets, subtargets, matrices, so on. Um, is there a is there a good resource for people to go to? I I don't have it now. Yeah, but uh, I, I just like remember some articles that I read in my university times too. Okay, so I I, I suppose we'll <laughs> just have to take a look at, at those things. Um. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, Maya does ask the question of, uh, do you have a Git repo that people can ponder and and study? Yes, as you as you can see, this uh, under Git, but uh, not pushed yet. <laughs> so okay. So I'll. Uh, I think I have I, I, that link right here, actually. Um, so I'll I'll post this, and then for for later, um, when you when you have ended up pushing this. You can take a look, of course. Yeah, I think yeah. I will push it today. That's um, great, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What uh, what I wanted to to show you actually is that, uh, like listening to all this stuff, it actually makes you a bit sad, and you like want to uh, understand what's going on inside, and uh, somehow to like visualize what you can see. Um, and what I did here, maybe you noticed that I have added just this uh, parameter, functional parameter. Uh, it's just a function that uh, should display something. And here in the very end, we render the, temp the table uh, for this. Um, and render the table with this um, function. And here, uh, there is actually the logic that 
builds a data frame uh, table. Uh, from uh, the record mask and uh, our arrays to two arrays there's a varar for them okay, um, I'm, I'm getting excited here because i i do we have seen data frame on on stream before and it does give you very nice tabular representation yeah. yep yep so here we use that frame just to visualize things so we like don't have uh uh, intend to have like some completion here, but just to visualize and see uh, how internals uh, look like. And uh, we do this like with this simple approach, just uh, provide some display methods that you can uh, pass to this calc arrangement, arrangements. And uh, here in the notebook, you just uh, call it this way, like you pass it, pass some uh, input string, you pass some uh, list description, and uh, here you use your display function. Uh, display function uh, is actually a function that is uh, defined inside the notebook, so you can use it here. And internally, it's it can render everything that is renderable and data frame tables are renderable. And as you can see, we even don't use uh, like any use data frame here. We just uh, have libraries defined here. Like we use all project libraries uh, that are loaded, effectively loaded with uh, Gradle. So here we can see Gradle and just hit that, see that there, there are less candy let's plot uh which is candy like wrapper for let's plot and data frame some dev version uh that allows us to use the latest features uh of this library uh, so uh so just, here you just, can see... just before just before we dive into this yeah I, I think i think it's really worth 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 pointing this out again so your your calc arrangements you don't define in your notebook or like like next to the notebook like it's something that you just have in your like regular kotlin project um yeah. like you, you have that just in your in your source set and then you can just pull this in uh into your notebooks and use it yes. from there okay. here you can use you can uh, select the modules that you will use on the notebook uh select uh, like we select our main module we don't need tests uh, so it is selected and then uh, you can use it in the notebook uh, when you update something uh, in the project you just need to restart this, the Kotlin notebook session and it will be uh, loaded uh, with the next session and uh, will be available here like completion uh, and uh, code navigation like they also work for these functions so we can just use them here and yeah, here we have the representation of uh, what what I have like talked uh, minutes ago. Uh, so here we have our string, right? And uh, here we see our mask, which we got from this list, right? So mm -hmm. uh, dot uh ds dot ds dot ds it once just the sequence of ones uh and uh on intersections uh we have values for both of our tables like you remember that we had uh, two tables and uh here you can see that in the end we um receive this six uh it's actually um um which is actually uh, an answer uh, for this problem. And uh, it, like, for example, if you are a teacher, you can use this tool and uh, explain like how everything works. So you wrote some code, uh, for example, and then uh, you worked a bit on visualizations, uh, provided uh, like this, like handles, like like this one and uh, just do this visualization 
uh, inside the notebook. Um, yeah, like that's it. Um, what what I also wanted to, sh to show um, is that we actually can look at all of this stuff uh, like uh, the mathematical objects. We can parameterize them, like not just uh, run our uh, calculations for the given strings, but uh, somehow parameterize uh, our problem and calculate something like generic. For example, here we introduce such function, which is called AG, like arrangements, uh, and uh, it calculates arrangement for the string consisting only of the question marks, of n question marks, and uh, the description of this string is consisting of m ones. So you need to place uh, m uh, dieses like uh, in this line of m uh, of n, and uh, from the very beginning it uh, looks like here you uh, uh, need to, to just calculate combinations, but it differs from the combinations in some in some way because. For combinations, like in, in binomial coefficients, uh, that's the same. Uh, you need, uh, you, you can like select every uh, index of the array, right? And uh, here you just, mm, you, here you need spaces between uh, between uh, the yeses. Like uh, that's why. Uh, this uh, function returns values that are less uh, than the same uh, the values for the same arguments for uh, binomial coefficients. But uh, I want to show that this like is very similar to actually what you uh, what you talked about. Uh, the, like the mostly like the same things. Uh, first of all, uh, we can print uh, our calculated arrangements uh, and see like that they form the tri triangle, right? And this triangle like uh, here, you can see that uh, at some point uh, it has the maximum, for example, here is the maximum, here is the maximum, here is the maximum, here is the maximum in a row and uh, after some point, uh, they're just zeros. It means that it's impossible at some point to uh, set this big number of uh, dieses in the string, and mm -hmm. uh, that's it. So, and it is very similar to Pascal Strangel. Uh, Pascal Strangel is uh, built from uh, uh, binomial coefficients, so uh, like it's similar, but Pascal Strangel is it is symmetric. As you can see, like uh, uh, maximum is in the middle of the string always, or they're duplicating two maxims. It depends on uh, on uh, if the length odds or uh, even. Um, yeah, but uh, in some in some way it's similar to it. And what we can do next, uh, we can write uh, such nice uh, function that plots uh, several functions uh, for the same uh, x's, x's. Um, and uh, actually I like took uh, this uh, read seat. Uh, like I'm not uh, not very familiar with candy library uh, which I used here, but I just uh, refer to their documentation. And I like really like it because it is stated, for example, you can see like there is a gallery of examples and you can just select uh, several lines. You need just to, to draw several lines for sure, like for the same abscesses, 
for, for the same axis, you need to draw uh, a line for each function. For uh, you need to draw family of function, and here you can find the receipt how to do it. Uh, so here you can see that if you have several uh, Ys, uh, you need to uh, join all these lists and repeat the list of X's uh, how many uh, so many times uh, so that it corresponds to how many Ys do you have, and uh, then you need uh, a category uh, which uh, will turn into into a color and it will like categorize uh, these plots and there will be different plots. So you just use uh, this approach and it uh, like in more details you can see like series hack. It's called series hack. Uh, it, it described here a bit in more, in more detail. Uh, so you use uh, just use this approach. Uh, to write this more generic function that function that uh, receives uh, the list of x's, the list of functions, and uh, plots all these functions. And for example, I decided to plot uh, this uh, this ag functions right uh, mm -hmm. for the range of uh, fifty. So we plotted like these functions. Uh, you see the same bug that uh, uh, Roma showed like the previous week. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but you see actually, you see these uh, plots. Uh, the colors uh, are enumerated. This is 51. This is uh, 50. This is uh, uh, 49. So it is expected, kind of expected. Uh, that they have uh, more like uh, the same center and they they are shifted to the left. Uh, and you can see that uh, now we can use the, the same function and to plot it uh, not for uh, not for uh, our uh, AG function but for uh, CN function, which is uh, essentially uh, a combination, um, combination which is uh, or uh, binomial co coefficient or like I told like several times. So we can build this this plot for it, and we can see that it it uh, reminds us of this plot actually. Like they are they look very 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 similar but we received these numbers in very different way like we received this number using uh, dynamic programming approach uh, and then just chose uh, then just have chosen some family of, of functions uh, from it but uh, uh, under the hood it's calculated like dynamic programming and in this case we use uh, actually a recursion with minimization uh, and uh, calculate uh, this binomial coefficients like in in other way, and it doesn't have like any story behind it. Just like the calculation using some mathematical formula, but they look like very similarly. And it, like just the thing that I wanted to to, to show that because like uh, actually I was uh, a bit amazed with uh, with the mathematics of this. Uh, of this, you know, uh, problem, and uh, wanted to share it with you. I'm, I'm curious now, now that you've you've brought this up. The, you you said these look similar. Would you reckon there is a way to derive one from the other, or do you think it's just that? Well, it's a they they remind you of the same thing, but they're still essentially or, or fundamentally different. Mm, I don't think uh, I don't I don't know. Uh, is there exact formula or not? Is there a formula to uh, find one from another? Um, I like told you what what is the difference uh, yeah mm -hmm. the difference is that uh, 
you just have uh yeah it's just like shorter in space uh in uh, in case of uh in in the first case and that's why uh that's why numbers are uh different and maybe if you like multiply something on something and uh calculate it like in some different way maybe maybe you will get the exact formulas maybe not for the whole uh solution uh but at least for uh this ag function yeah so maybe for this ag function which is like special subset of the of the solutions uh you you will find some formula i don't know for sure okay yeah fair enough i i just wondered uh because as you said they do they do look similar with with their own twist of course um i i did want to point out uh this this uh, this one fun comment because when you uh when when you showed the uh or or, or when you kind of also talked a little bit about the the problem i immediately i was like reminded of like also i was around of like n queens where, where it's like uh well you you have some kind of constraints about how you're allowed to place items but of course you're you're just on a on a one-dimensional board rather than a multi-dimensional board so i guess it could be like n kings almost um like on a uh on on just a on just the line uh miro pointed out um that essentially what we're doing is is we're, we're solving uh one line of the uh nonogram game um which uh if we can i'll i'll, I'll just briefly pull up a, a an image of that over here is essentially a, a a puzzling game where you're given uh length of consecutive uh groups mm -hmm. of pixels um in in either direction and you need to place them so that they are satisfied in in both dimensions i suppose so that's uh, that's a really interesting interpretation that I hadn't, uh, that that I did not have in mind. So that's that's really cool. Um, yeah, this is really yeah. Um, there's oh, there's a couple. Oh. There's a yeah. Go ahead. Yep, I just wanted to 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 say that actually, um, you also can. What you can do uh, is that you can share. It, for example, this notebook on GitHub. Uh, like, uh, yeah, you are using some uh, methods from your project, and uh, it uh, it will not run there. But uh, at least uh, you can just upload this notebook on GitHub, and uh, for example, or somewhere somewhere else. Like you know, there are many. Uh, providers but github gifts are very uh easy to use and free so uh you can just upload it and uh, uh, share the link and it will be displayed like with all the outputs that you have including plots this uh this is incorrect one uh, actually but <laughs> yeah uh so you can go ahead and share uh, your notebooks uh, with uh, all the like investigations and visualizations you've made even uh, if it's not possible to you know, like for for people to immediately load it an idea and uh, see it there so um, that's probably like very interesting use case yeah but the 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 fact that these are that these are shared is, is is honestly really really exciting um people have already fallen in love with uh kotlin notebooks uh, on on the way here so there there are a couple of follow up questions uh, maya asks is there a reference link for all the things that display can show um is is the first part of the question the other question is can you like refresh the display so can you like animate for example how values change uh 
Yeah, actually, I know I know Maya because uh, we're conversating from time to time in notebook Slack. Uh, in not in not notebooks, but Kotlin Lang Slack in the notebooks channel, and uh, yeah, nice to see her there. Um, so, um, regarding display function, uh, display function uses uh, the concept of rendering. Uh, so, first of all, uh, it it uh, accepts any uh, object. And uh, it tries to render it with defined renderers, which are, which can be defined in your library. For example, for example, data frame library defines renderers for data frame objects, and you can define uh, its own library, and uh, you can just read it uh, on uh, in our documentation uh, for Kotlin kernel API. Uh, so the answer is if it if uh, the renderer is defined or if the object implements renderable interface it will be rendered uh, somehow it could be rendered uh, for example as a swing uh, like native tam table uh, like data frame in my uh, id or it could be rendered uh, with another client as you see like it is rendered like html table uh, in github it is like the same notebook but rendered uh, differently on github and uh, on idea uh it can be rendered uh, as a plot and uh, also it can, like uh can have uh, this fancy tool tips in idea and can be just an image uh on github uh it can be rendered just as text so if you pass uh, an object that doesn't have any renders defined uh to string will be called and so it will be rendered just like to string uh, just just like it, it, its string representation will be uh, shown. Um, you can call uh, several. You can call display several times. You can also provide ID for each uh, uh, displayable object. And uh, there is a function in API which is called update display, which actually updates it. But uh, regarding this function, it doesn't work in idea, uh, unfortunately. So uh, it this uh, not yet supported uh, in the protocol so it and in idea it doesn't work uh, uh, properly uh, but uh, it works in another clients uh, for example in uh, uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks or in data lore it should work too so you can try another clients with uh, uh, yeah you can try another clients, uh, other clients, and uh, it will work there. Um, yeah, but uh, it's actually rather rare uh, thing. It, it it it's needed rather rarely, uh, and uh, we will uh, work in this direction, and we will work on providing more outputs for specific use cases and uh, for providing this basic functionality too. Uh, yep. So, you know. That's okay. that's the answer. Yeah, I mean that was a great answer. This uh, <laughs> so uh, still some things even to look forward to, and I think yeah, Maya has gotten a um, a good a, a good answer here. Um, I think it's it's important to mention this one again because because Miro asks yeah they or said I fell in love with, with notebooks instantly and and is it available in in Android <laughs> Studio? Um, and yeah, I think I think Roman already answered this one uh, on on day five here. But you're of course more than welcome to uh, to answer this one again. Uh, I will say that it's not, not uh, yet decided, and it's not decided in what form it will be. Uh, there are some uh, technical uh, limitations uh, to this too, uh, but uh, like non-technical questions are also uh, arise, and it's not clear should or not we do this so uh, uh like that's for now that's the question and uh it mm, it it depends like we are we are thinking of course we we having this in mind but i can't answer you like how it will be fair enough and i mean yeah 
you'll definitely i i think we're by the looks of it wherever you put kotlin notebooks you'll have fans <laughs> Um, so this is uh, this is quite great. Um, uh, you said you said Roman. I thought for a second wait, Roman Yelizaros was on the stream. No, Roman Belov was on the stream. Um, but you should still check out that uh, that stream recording nonetheless. Um, he also did a very impressive demo of Kotlin notebooks. Also, actually, with tons of visualizations and sh showed off some some of the candy library um, that we've that we've seen again today. Um, so that's definitely something that you can also still take a take a peek at. Wonderful, great. Well, Ilya, thank you so much uh, for for presenting uh, the solution today, and I guess teaching all of us a little bit more about dynamic programming and uh, and Kotlin notebooks. It was a good combination. Thank you, Seth, for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking with you and uh, with with the chat and seeing like our users here. Like I'm uh, always very pleasant to uh, talk to, talk to you. And uh, like if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, ideas, you're very welcome to uh, join Notebooks channel and Data Science channel in Cotton Slack and uh right there we are here to us answer you like well really loving our users uh, yeah i think i i also want to say once again thank you so much folks for uh for being so engaged with the stream as well it's it it makes uh it makes the whole experience for us also uh, more pleasant when there's people to talk to and people to engage with and it seems like everyone's getting something out of it um, yeah, like uh, like Ilya said, um, Kotlin no notebooks and data science have their own uh, Slack channels on the Kotlin Lang Slack, and so does Advent of Code. So I will use this opportunity for one last time to shout out our blog post. Uh, if you haven't seen it by now, I don't know how you missed it. Make sure you are a part of the Kotlin Lang Slack and hang out in the in the channels because this was unfortunately the last stream for this year in regards to Advent of Code. Which is a bit of a shame, but you know, all good things come to an end. And I think we've had a really, really delightful 12 days of Advent of Code with Kotlin. I mean, thinking back to it, we've had so many wonderful guests. We had Todd, who does the the blogging and, and always does nice write-ups on the very first day. We had Atyom, uh, who showed us Amper and a little bit of magic with that. And we did, we even did a little, like a tiny bit of Compose multi-platform in that scenario. We had Maya on. It was always a delight, uh, and this is of course also here. Uh, in chat and, and provided a really cool view on things. We had Dima Kandalov who, who showed us, who took up the challenge and, and actually did a bunch of live coding uh, and live refactoring. Um, just really, really impressive. We had Roman who, who showed us a bunch of uh, Kotlin notebook stuff at the very beginning. We had Ephemian who, of course, solves Advent of Code in more languages than anyone can, can ever imagine. Uh, we had Martom, who, who joined me in Munich, uh, and we set up a, a cute little cozy studio in, in our office, and I think had a pretty good hangout time, even though I've been told there have been some audio issues. We had Salim, who talked about Kotlin for, for WebAssembly, and we even saw some Compose for WebAssembly. Um, so Compose for Web running there as well. This is Olaf... Uh, who who did all the, the who did a couple of visualizations and we even saw one of the visualizations even though he got a little unlucky with the the selection for for his task we still saw one we had Dave uh, we also hung out with it just was just a, a delightful time uh, to to spend some time with Svetlana showed her uh, her wonderful slides like a proper developer advocate and of course today we end on a real high note with with you Ilya. so thank you again so much uh for for coming on and 
yeah, thanks to everybody who decided to spend one of their afternoons, one of the evenings uh, with us, or who just decided to learn a little bit more about Kotlin in any other way this year. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I hope that you still enjoy the rest of Advent of Code, and we will see each other in some kind of other format at some point in the future, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Take care, and see you in a future one. Take care. Bye-bye.